invite you to take God's word and open to 2 Timothy chapter 4, the fourth chapter of 2 Timothy. We're going to begin reading in verse 6, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 6. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the word of God. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Let's pray together. Lord, we come before you, honoring your word, thanking you for it, asking that you would help us understand and apply it, and in all this be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask you a question. It's about four questions. How do you answer the four big questions of life? Who am I? Where did I come from? What is my purpose here? And where am I going? The Bible speaks with unique authority about these questions and gives absolutely the answer to these questions. I say the answer because it is the most authoritative answer because it's God himself in the pages of the Bible who reveals his will to us and in that answers those four questions for us. Who am I? Where did I come from? What is my purpose here? Where am I going? Each of these questions is vital. And the message we're about to talk about, the text before us, and this is really the initial text we'll go to, the message concerns the last of these four. Where am I going? And the answer has a lot to do with how we're related to the one who is returning to earth as its rightful king and heir, heir of all things. So where do you go for answers? Where do you look to? What is your go-to source? There are many different voices in our world clamoring for our attention, and man is often wanting to find these answers, but not always going to the right source for the answers. There's the speculative area, the speculative approach, the psychic medium, the Gene Dixon of a former generation, it's in vogue to add this kind of spiritual dimension to our lives, to have a palm read, to go to those who seem to be in the know regarding the future. That is sadly the case because it's actually an abomination to go to anything other than God for revelation of the future. Both uh, the Old and the New Testament warn against that uh, course. Isaiah 8 uh, speaks of going to the mediums, those that whisper and mutter, should not a people go to their God, to the law and to the testimony. That's where we should go, the law of God. Many go to astrology. In fact, these speculative sources are only ever at best 5% accurate. You might be reading the Zodiac reading for the day. Many do in the newspaper and the online newspapers, and they don't start their day until they've done that. And it's usually after about three weeks of, I'm just about to throw in the towel, there's nothing here. But on the 21st day, something happens. Oh, that that kind of, I'm reading at the end of the day, that's exactly what happened. And they've caught you, they've captured you, you're in their web. You might say, but doesn't the star of Bethlehem at the time of Jesus' birth prove that astrology is legitimate. No, it's actually the exact opposite to that. Astrology teaches that it's the position of the stars at the time of a baby's birth that affects the baby. At Bethlehem, what we see in our Bible is that it's the position of the baby that affect, that affected the movement of the stars. Totally opposite, total contrast. So there's one approach, and another is speculative, and then in the area of science, speculation by means of science. The scientific approach, science predicts certain things, including the end of the world. 
When I was growing up, the end of the world was predicted by science to be 2050. That's more worrying than it was back then because we're only three decades away from that. 30 years away. And with the scientific approach, historically, there's been about a 20 to 25 percent accuracy in regards to the predictions. But there's a third approach, and that is the approach of going to Scripture, what God has revealed. And what we have in our Bible is a lot of predictive prophecy. One out of every four verses in our Bible, a quarter of our Bible, contains predictive prophecy. About 80% or even more than that have already been fulfilled regarding the prophecies of the Bible. That's exciting to us as Christians, but it doesn't mean that the Bible's only 80% accurate. It's actually 100% accurate. And the reason the remaining 20% haven't been fulfilled is that the remaining 20% relate to the events surrounding the second coming of Christ. And we would not expect them to be fulfilled in that the second coming has yet to occur. The Bible is 100% accurate, but why do people not gravitate towards their Bibles to know the future? The fact is, people like independence from God. We want inside information. We just don't want to go to God for it. We like to have a handle on something that will tell us the future without being responsible to the one who holds the future. We want to be in control. That's really the nature of man. We love our independence. When it comes to Bible prophecy, there's a lot of speculation in that area. And there are a lot of uh, things that divide Christians as to the precise nature and timing of events surrounding the second coming of Christ. I remember on a plane trip from London and England to the United States, leaving Gatwick Airport south of London, As is normally the case, you get up into the air and the houses are still very large at the beginning and you can see the fences, you can see the dividing mark, the the boundary marks between different houses. As you go over fields, you see the fences. But the further you go up, the less and less you can see the fences, the thing that divide neighbor from neighbor. And in a sense, that's what I want us to do. You could still see the houses, but it was very hard after a while to see the fences. And in this area of Bible prophecy, there is far more that unites us as Orthodox Christians regarding the second coming of Christ than divides us. And as we go and take a bird's eye look way up in the air, we'll see that the divisions really are not that consequential, especially regarding the big event of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this time when many are fearful, it's so important to have hope And the Bible speaks of the second coming of Christ as our blessed hope. And I want to instill hope in you today, not to look to the world and to the nations of the world to get their act together. That's a hopeless cause. But the coming of Christ brings certain hope. When the Bible speaks about hope, it's not such as the English weather where I grew up. You hoped for good weather for the wedding. You hoped for good weather when certain events are taking place, certain sporting events. But you never know. English weather is so changeable. You never know. You hope, but it's not in any way certain. But when the Bible speaks of our hope, it is a sure expectation of what will certainly take place. And that is the case with the second coming of Christ. Christ came the first time, and it was not... News, as in, this had not been taught before, not been shared before, this information was not given before. No, the Bible was full of predictive prophecies about the first coming of Christ. So was the case that people were able, if they were only to look, to know where this King Messiah would be born. He would be born in Bethlehem rather than somewhere else. That immediately puts so many people out of the picture. Where were you born? Oh, Seattle, Washington. Sorry, you can't qualify to be the Messiah. Where were you born? Jerusalem. That's close, but it's not close enough. It's Bethlehem where he will be born. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. So it is, as we go on through predictive prophecy, we see time after time after time, 
prophecies being filled in the life of Jesus. I remember making a list. In fact, I think I found a list and copied it. And over the years, have turned to it many, many times to see 30 predictive prophecies that were fulfilled in the life of Jesus in one single day. 30 in one day. Over 300 were fulfilled in his lifetime, but 30 of them in one day. Quite amazing. We call these predictions of the Messiah messianic prophecies. See, God was giving a sure, certain way to recognize his Messiah when he came. They're events written in the Bible centuries, sometimes even thousands of years in advance. It's history written in advance. And only God who knows the future, he's the Alpha and the Omega, only he could reveal to the prophets of the Old Covenant the things concerning Messiah in advance, in this kind of detail. God declared that his Messiah would be a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Judah, a son of David. God also said he would be born of a virgin. He would be born in poverty. He would be preceded by a herald. He would be born in Bethlehem, the city of David. He'd be seen riding a donkey. He'd present himself, get this, 483 years after the decree was made to rebuild Jerusalem. That's pretty specific. And after the Babylonian captivity, he'd be a prophet, he'd be a priest, he'd be a king, but there's more. He would be legally tried and condemned to death, would suffer and die by means of the piercing of his hands and feet. His death would be substitutionary in the place of others. He'd be buried in a rich man's tomb and he'd be resurrected from the dead. That's kind of specific. If you're going to start a religion, uh, I would advise don't do it unless you've got these kind of credentials. All in all, over 300 prophecies were fulfilled by Jesus in his first coming. A a French mathematician, George Heron, calculated that the odds of one man fulfilling only 40, that's four with a zero, 40 of these prophecies are one in 10 to the power of 157. That is a one followed by a hundred and 57 zeros. You need to bear in mind that uh, many more prophecies will be fulfilled when he comes back to this earth. Praise the Lord. The scripture says of that one day, 30 prophecies, he'd be betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver. The money would be used to buy a field. The shepherd would be killed. The sheep would flee. He'd be spat on and mocked. He'd have shame and dishonor. There would be false witnesses. They'll be gambling for his clothes. He opened not his mouth. He was too weak to carry the cross. He was thirsty. He was given vinegar to drink. They stare at Jesus on the cross. They crucify him. Water flows out of a wound. Friends stand afar off. People wagged mocking heads. There was a challenge for God to save him. He's the Lamb of God, yet he prays for his killers. He cries out to God. He's a broken man, yet he's a king. He bears our sins in his body. He is declared faultless. He gives up his spirit. His bones are not broken. He's numbered with the transgressors. He died, but not for himself. Satan bruised Jesus' heel on the cross. He was laid in a rich man's tomb. There was darkness at the crucifixion. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? 30 of these. He is the Savior of the world. He is the long-awaited Messiah. And the early church presented the message of King Jesus to their world by going to what we call the Old Covenant. The New Covenant was not yet written, but they could prove that Jesus was the Messiah from the Scripture because of the predicted prophecies fulfilled. Praise the Lord. We're in 2 Timothy. I'd like you now to go again to the verses that were read just earlier. In the context of the Apostle Paul in chapter 3, declaring that wisdom is available for salvation through the Scripture, it's so clear that anyone can get it. It's able to make you wise for salvation. You don't need this man or that man or this group or this administrative company. You just need the Scripture to know how to be saved through faith in the Lord Jesus. And then Paul, in writing to Timothy, his last letter to him, 
said that Scripture is all you need. It's not only necessary for your ministry, it's sufficient. It will equip you for every good work. Anything you'll face in the ministry, the Scripture equips you. That's the message of 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And then in the opening verses of chapter 4, the solemn charge is given to Timothy. Preach the word in season, out of season. You're in the eyeballs of God. You're under the gaze of God. Be faithful to him. Be a herald of his word in good times and hard times. That's what it means by in season and out of season. Preach it when they like it. Preach it when they don't like it. You preach to an audience of one. If he's happy, it doesn't matter who's unhappy. If he's unhappy, it doesn't matter who's happy. Hallelujah. And then in verse 6, For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. Paul was saying, I'm poured out. My life has been poured out as an offering. And again, I believe it's a, a, a hearkening back to the Old Testament and the, the offerings there where some were poured out. And he's speaking of himself. Let me just interject at this point that the men greatly used of God in generations before us were never half committed people. They gave themselves wholly to God. A quote that's often attributed to D.L. Moody was this, the world has yet to see what God can do with a man fully consecrated to him by God's help. I aim to be that man. Whether or not D.L. Moody said this, what is for sure is that Paul was such a man. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, he wrote. And the time of my departure uh, literally release, a departure release. The time of my departure has come. We understand that because uh, when planes are operating, we go to the departure lounge and look for the timing of our plane flight to find out when it's leaving. When is it departing? And he says, the time of my departure has come. Verse 7, I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. These phrases are written in what we call the perfect tense. It refers to something that's already done, completely done, absolutely finished. Literally, the word order is significant. It goes like this. The good fight, I fought it. The course, I finished it. The faith, I've kept it. This was not faith in general, but the faith, the Christian faith, I've kept it. And then verse 8, in the future, Paul writes, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. In the original language of our New Testament, there are two Greek words for crown. There's the familiar word diadem, which refers to a royal crown. And then there is the word we find in our text, stephanos, the word used here, it refers to a laurel wreath. It was a wreath that was given to the winner of a contest. To update that, it would be something like the Olympic Games where the winner is given the gold medal. Back then in the first century, they were given the laurel wreath. And that's the word used here. It's a word of honor. It speaks of conquest. It, is, it corresponds to a massive reward. And Paul writes, there is laid up for me the stephanos, the crown, the reward of righteousness. He then writes, which the Lord, the righteous judge. Let me just stop there for a moment. Paul was awaiting the verdict of an unrighteous judge. He was about to lose his life because of an unrighteous judge. But he looked beyond the temporary and he could see that he was now in departure lounge, awaiting the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. What a statement. He had his eyes on the eternal. The temporary looked bleak. He was about to depart this world. But he says, there's going to be an amazing reward just moments away when I see him, when I see him. 
But notice this. He doesn't just speak of himself. He writes, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. This speaks of a special reward for those who, look at the text, have loved. Have loved here again is the perfect tense. It speaks of something that's settled. It's a settled attitude. What's interesting too is the word love here is the Greek word agapeo. We often speak of the agape, love of God. Here is agapeo, a form of that word that speaks of driving, intense love. And so this was a settled attitude of absolute intense love for something, for his appearing. May I ask you, Christian, do you qualify for this prize, for this crown? Remembering the qualification for this reward, this stuff on us of righteousness is a settled, deep, intense love for the second coming of Christ for the appearance of Christ. While Christians, as I say, may may divide over where the fences should go in Bible prophecy, take the big picture. Do you love the appearance of Christ? Is that your blessed hope? Is that what you're looking for? If not, I want to stir that hope up in you today. I want you to love His appearing. So does this describe you? Can your Christian life be described in this way? Or are you like so many, caught up in the trappings of this world? It's interesting when we read the book of Revelation and Babylon falls, which is this huge, mega, religious organization. Whatever we may think it is, it's got the wealth of the world. And it falls. And along with it, all finance is doomed. And yet the people of God cry out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Their investment was not in this world. They'd stored up things in heaven rather than things on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. They were unattached from Babylon. And during this time, may the Holy Spirit work in us so that whether we work or whether we're unemployed, we're going through hopefully a very temporary measure. We're not attached to the things of this world as our value, as that for which we pursue only. But our heart cry is, Lord, let me be storing up treasure for another world, for the world to come. I'd like you to go in your Bibles to the right, to Hebrews chapter 9 for a moment. We're just going to hone in on a couple of verses Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, the writer writes, And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. Sin is not an issue for the many. Sin is not an issue for them because their sins have been borne by him. And he's coming back. He will appear a second time for salvation. When we look at the word salvation, it is something that occurs in the original language in all the tenses possible. It speaks of will be saved, being saved, has been saved, will be saved. Because there's an element of salvation, even though we have been saved from the wrath of God by the sacrifice of Jesus, there's an element of our salvation that still waits consummation. We're going to see that as we progress. And he's going to appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin. He's not going to bring a sin offering again. He's done that in his first coming. But he's coming back, look at what it says, to those who eagerly await him. Again, does that describe you? Back in our Bibles to Titus, 1 Timothy, we were in 2 Timothy. Let's go to the book of Titus and chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, verse 1. 
2, chapter 2 of Titus, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, all kinds of people, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. Again, let me stop for a moment. Grace not only saves, brings salvation to people, all people, all kinds of people, no matter what their ethnic background, no matter where they live on planet Earth. They might be on the sea. They might be on some remote island. But when grace comes, it brings the message of salvation and it saves. It saves a people. But it also does something else. If you look in the text, it instructs us. Grace teaches us. And what does it teach us? It teaches us to say no. It teaches us to deny. That's what saying no means. To deny means no, no, no. We have to do that with dogs sometimes. They want food from the table. No, we give them a denial. Instructing us, what does? Grace, the grace of God that brings salvation, that has appeared to all men, teaches us, instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. What does? Grace does. Grace teaches us to say no, and also to now live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. The grace of God in salvation also works in the saved to make them say no to some things and yes to other things. If you love something, you'll hate something that comes against it. If you love children, you will hate abortion. If you love the law of God, you'll hate laws that are raised in defiance of God's law. If you love people, you'll hate what comes against people. It speaks of the present age. Do you again see that in the text? To live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. The present age, according to Galatians chapter 1, is an evil age. I believe it will always be an evil age until Jesus comes back. That's why we are told, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's not a gradual possession of the age whereby it gradually becomes more and more perfect until Jesus comes. And we say, oh, nice for you to come back. We, we had it all kind of done before you arrived. No, it's a present evil age. And the reason for that is the ruler of this age is evil. His rule is very temporary. He's been defeated on the cross by the Lord Jesus Christ and is now under the heel of the Lord Jesus. But Jesus is coming back and will absolutely consummate the defeat of Satan. It will be absolute. The Bible speaks in Galatians 1 of Christ Jesus who gave himself for our sins that he might rescue us from this present evil age. The age around us has a philosophy, a value system, and we're not to be conformed to it. And if everything was becoming more and more perfect, wouldn't the Bible at some point say, just before Jesus comes back, the age is going to be perfect. You can be conformed to the world then. You can be conformed to this age then. But no, while this age remains, this age is an evil age. Christ's coming will mark the end of this present age. Just as at the first coming, he split time in half, B.C., before Christ, to A.D., Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord, at least for the Western calendar. When he comes back, he's going to split this age and the age to come. When he comes, immediately, it is now the age to come. Verse 13, looking for the blessed hope. That's my theme. The blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Is that your blessed hope? If it is, rejoice, because it will happen. You may not live to see it, but it will happen. You can die knowing it will happen. 
Just because it may not happen in our lifetime doesn't mean it won't happen, it will happen. Just as every old covenant sake longed for the first coming of the Messiah and He came, we can look for the second coming of this same one and He will come. In John chapter 14, He said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again. Hear that. I will come again. He's coming back, folks. Who? Our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. It's actually here that we have to revise the King James Version. The King James Version at this point renders this phrase, our great God and our Savior. And that's not as clear as the more modern translations. If you have a good translation in front, in front of you in the modern vernacular, the ESV, the NASB, the NIV, all of these will, will do what needs to be done and update the old English of the King James Version. The Greek is still the same, but our understanding of Greek has really escalated since the 17th century. King James Version was first translated in 1611, as you might remember. And our knowledge of Greek has definitely uh, undergone a, a lot of transformation in a good sense. You see, according to the King James Version, that phrase could equally be viewed as referring to two distinct persons, our great God and our Savior. But thankfully, a man named Granville Sharp discovered a rule in Greek, and it's therefore called the Granville Sharp Rule. I don't have time to go into it, but in layman's terms, the form of the words here make it clear that the great God and our Savior is one and the same person. This is a text that speaks of the divinity, the deity of Jesus Christ. Jehovah's Witnesses cannot handle that verse. Mormons misunderstand it also. They deny, Jehovah's Witnesses, the full deity of Christ. He's a God, but he's a created being. A God with a small g. But no, he's the great God. He's our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We worship him. Looking for, it says, the blessed hope and the appearing. You know, what I'm doing here is going to the end of the text first, our great God and Savior, and then backing up, going to the start of the verse where he says and writes, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here it's helpful to us to familiarize ourselves with three Greek words. You might have uh, heard these along the way in your Christian life. Let me put them together. Parousia, the parousia speaks of presence, speaks of an arrival, speaks of a royal coming. It can also refer to an invading army. That can be a parousia, an arrival. The second word is apocalypsis. We get the English word apocalyptic from this word. It's an unveiling. It's something revealed, something uncovered. The idea here is to uncover something so that it appears as it really is. There's been something of a fog, but after the unveiling, now you see clearly. And third, third word is epiphania. Epiphania. It means to appear. It means to appear in a great act of power. It speaks of a revelation of power. And it's that third word that's used here regarding appearing. Looking for the blessed hope and the epiphania in a great act of power, an appearance, a revelation of our great God and Savior. You see, ladies and gentlemen, this is our blessed hope. Not that the United Nations will somehow get the right vote in and deal with everything on planet Earth and we'll have peace in our time. Our hope is not found in the governments of this world, in the handouts of this world, in what man can do for us. We don't trust in horses and chariots. Our trust is in the name of the Lord of hosts. Our hope is found not in a committee, 
but in a person and his appearing. That's our blessed hope. His appearance in power. Unlike the first coming of Christ, which was relatively quiet. Only a few were there to witness a pretty amazing light show. But only a few saw it. Very few knew of it. It was quiet. It was cloaked in humility. In contrast, this appearance, this second coming of Christ will be loud. It will be very loud. It will actually be loud enough to wake the dead. And it will. That's how loud it will be. Verse 14, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed. Who is the us? It's the people of God. It says it in specific language in the next phrase. And to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Christ on the cross purified for himself a people for his own possession. Elsewhere, this group, this people is called the church. He laid his life down for his friends. He gave himself for the church. He gave himself for this people, his own possession, who are zealous for good deeds. We understand this, don't we? That Christ saves by what he did alone. And our works, our good deeds never save us, but we're not saved by our good works, as Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 makes clear. By grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That's verse 9. But verse 10 of Ephesians 2 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. He's created us in Christ for the good works he's prepared for us to do. So we're not saved by good works, we're saved for good works. And Christ gave himself to redeem and to purify a people zealous for good works. Notice the the motivation for the way we live is the anticipation of the Lord's coming again. See it again, verses 12 and 13 instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for, all of this is under the canopy of grace teaching us. Grace teaches us to say no to some things, yes to others, and to look for the blessed hope and the epiphania, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. So what happens when he comes? There's a number of things. I'm not sure we'll get to all of them, but let me mention a few. Firstly, our salvation will be consummated. As I say, the word salvation is used in every possible tense. Be saved, being saved, will be saved. And there's an aspect of our salvation that awaits the second coming of Christ one of which is our bodies will be transformed. Go with me to Philippians, back to the left in our Bibles. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. When you're a young man or a young woman, this doesn't have the same thrill it does when you get over 40, 50, into your 60s, 70s, and you long for a different kind of body. Uh, When you're young, you think, oh, resurrection body, just slight improvement on what I've got. Not so when uh, things begin to break down. But in Philippians, look with me in chapter 3, verse 8. More than that, he says, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. Again, the message of salvation is so clear in the scripture. 
We don't need help um, to understand this. Help usually helps us misunderstand this. It's so clear. Salvation is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. This is Christ's righteousness that is imputed to the, to the account of the believer. Continuing on. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained, as we say so often, we haven't arrived, but thank God we've left. Not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. So it goes on. Our bodies, verse 20, are referred to here. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also, do you see these words? We eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It identifies the one we're waiting for. Who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. The Bible here in one translation refers to the body as a body of humiliation. And Paul's words here is that by any means I may attain this resurrection of the body. That's our hope. We'll get a brand new body, glorious just like Jesus' resurrected body, which shall not decay or grow old. There's a second aspect of what happens when Jesus comes back. Creation will be released from the curse. Turn to Romans 8 for a moment. I'm just highlighting certain things that we could spend weeks on, and you understand that, but let's look at the text. Romans 8, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation wakes eagerly. See, creation is waiting eagerly. Isn't that an interesting phrase? It's the same idea we read in Hebrews and we've read elsewhere. Waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption, into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves. And so it goes on. Creation will be released from the curse at the second coming of Christ. And third aspect of his coming is that it will be a revelation of judgment. The Apostles' Creed, as we recite in our church services, says it this way. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from there... He will come to judge the living and the dead. Turn to Psalm 96 for a moment in the Old Testament. Psalm 96. Read with me verse 11. Let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all it contains. Let the field exult. And all that is in it, then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy. Sing for joy. Can trees sing? Well, this is poetic language. But it's poetic language to describe a real reality. An absolute reality. Creation itself will be set free from its futility, as we've read in Romans 8. And the trees will sing for joy. Prophetic language for liberation. Before the Lord. They'll be singing before the Lord. Before Yahweh himself. For he is coming. Who's coming? Yahweh. The Lord Jesus is God. He is coming to judge the earth. He'll judge the world in righteousness 
and the peoples in his faithfulness. Turn to Psalm 98. Look with me then in verse 7. Let the sea roar and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Trees singing, rivers clapping. Let the mountains sing together for joy before the Lord, before Yahweh, for he is coming to judge the earth. He'll judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Matthew chapter 25. On to the right to the New Testament. This gives us an understanding of some of the specifics regarding judgment. Matthew chapter 25, I'm just going to read verse 31 through 33. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, notice the time indicator, when. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then. What does the then refer to? The then refers to the when. When the Son of Man comes, what will he do? Then he will sit on his glorious throne. There's no gap here. It's then, at his coming, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he'll separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. There's much more in that passage and if we don't, Uh, help ourselves, we'll dive in and we'll never get out, not without a few uh, tens of minutes occurring. It's not amazing. He comes and he comes to sit on his glorious throne. Let me just ask you, where will you be on that day? Will you be among the sheep or will you be among the goats? Lastly, let's go to 1 John chapter 3. Again, we're seeing the broad, the big picture, perspective of our blessed hope. 1 John chapter 3, look with me in verse 2. Beloved, oh how the Lord wants us, his people, to know we are loved by him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. But we know that when He appears. Again, a reference to the second coming of Christ. We will be like him because we will see him just as he is. Again, this is an unveiling, the revelation of him. He's not coming to be crowned a king. He already is the crowned king of the universe. He sits in the place of all authority. He's able to say in Matthew 28, all authority has been given to me, not will be one day, has been given to me both in heaven and in earth and on earth. Therefore, go. You go in my name. You go in my authority. Why? Because I own everything. There's not a place you can go to on planet earth that Jesus doesn't own. Think about that. I've been in an amazing amount of nations in the world. Been to Mongolia, China, India, Australia, New Zealand, United States, Canada, Mexico, England. Been around. And every foot, every inch belongs to Jesus Christ. That's why we can go. That's why we can go with the gospel. What is the gospel? Ah, I'm glad you asked. The gospel is the power of God for the salvation. It's about a God who's absolute in love, in Trinitarian love, spilling over into creation, making man in the image of God and the likeness of God, responsible to obey this God, glorifying him in all that they do. Mankind is to love God with all heart, soul, mind and strength. To love Him with our thoughts, to love Him with our words, to love Him with our actions. Yet we've defied God. Committed high treason against God. Deserve to be banished from His presence forever. Rebellious. Unthankful. Unholy as we were. And yet God did not wait for us to turn and act a little better or climb some mountain of holiness. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. When did he do this? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for the ungodly, not the morally improving group. While we were still shaking our fists at God, God loved us and sent his son for us. 
And Jesus came born of a virgin, living a sinless life, dying an atoning death on the cross, and then rising again three days later. And now he's at the place of all authority in this universe. And he says, repent and believe the good news. What's the good news? God is willing to govern the human race. Anyone who comes to him, you'll be spared from the judgment to come. What judgment to come? The judgment at the second coming of Christ. Call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Be rescued from the wrath to come. And God has it that all who do that, all who believe in the Son will be spared judgment, but more than that, given the bounty of heaven forever as a gift. It's good news. That's why they call it the gospel. But we read verse 2 in 1 John 3. Let's read verse 3. And everyone, I'd say that means 100%, not 36% on a good day, but everyone. In other words, anyone who actually believes in the second coming of Christ, in his appearance, Everyone who has this hope fixed on him does something, purifies himself just as he is pure. I thought we can't purify ourselves. No, we can't by ourselves, but we can put ourselves in the position of being purified by him by means of his ordinary means, the means of grace, hearing the word, gathering with his assembly, doing what we know to do according to the Scripture. If you love the Lord your God, you'll do what He says with your time, your talents, and your treasure. You'll be purified. You will do that because you have a hope that one day I'll stand before the Lord and not only give an account to God, but be rewarded for my labor here. Such is God's gift to us that though salvation itself is by grace, So the work he does in and through us is because of his grace working in us, teaching us to say no and say yes and live godly, looking for the appearance of Christ. This blessed hope acts as a means of purification in the life of a believer. And if there's no ongoing process of purification, let me challenge you to come to Christ and be sure of your salvation. Or else, fix your thoughts on the second coming of Christ. Let it be your hope. Not that you wake up tomorrow and things will be different in this world. But one day, a day that is on God's calendar, known only to Him, Jesus Christ will return. No man knows the hour. No man knows the day of His coming. Jan Crouch, I hope, was joking when she said, it says no man knows the hour. It didn't say no woman. No, it meant no one. No one knows. We're not to speculate regarding the time, but the big picture is the Lord Jesus Christ will return. Will you be ready for his return? He comes as a thief in the night, unannounced, and yet here he's announcing, I will come. You just don't know when. Let me end with a hymn spoken, written some time back called come quickly lord creation groans beneath the curse rebellion's just reward we long to see the fall the fall reversed and eden's joys restored so weary of our traitorous flesh of sin we hate yet crave we yearn to see temptation's death in dwellings sin's dark grave. We want to hear the joyous cries and join the ransom throng. The Lamb is worthy. Praise will rise from every tribe and tongue. We joy to fix our gaze on Christ, though now our view is dim. We long for heaven's grandest prize to see and be like him. Here's the chorus, sang at every interval in between these stanzas. Come quickly, Lord, make all things new. Redeem the church, your bride. With longing eyes, we look for you, for home is at your side. Let's pray together. Lord, 
may we with one heart and voice cry out, Abba, Father, and cry out, Maranatha, come, come, Lord Jesus. Amen.